obviously all the parties will be looking at how can they engage with, how can they convert the 40% of the public who are still undecided and that is a very, very large number at this stage in the campaign. What you've seen over the last 20 years is a real change in voter behaviour in this country and the traditional uh, le um, Labour Conservative bloc vote simply aren't there anymore and you've got 40% as I say now who are really undecided many of whom might be undecided until they actually draw the curtain in the, um, in the booth and mark X on the, uh, against the name. That is a challenge. More broadly, and I think uh, longer term, the challenge is how we engage with, how we connect with the three in ten voters who are unlikely to vote at all. These are the people who would really switch over to EastEnders uh, when the news is on or they might turn to magic uh, when a political leader is being interviewed on the news, say, at, at, at one o'clock. We need to find a way of engaging with people so we can express, we can communicate, we can really make the case for why politics is important in this country. At the 2010 election, for the first time in a generation, we had a hung parliament with the Conservatives nor the Labour Party able to command an absolute majority. But even in that situation, the parliamentary arithmetic clearly favoured a, a coalition between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, and that's what we, we had. This time around, it's going to be much tighter, with some polls suggesting the Conservatives and the Labour Party could even be tied when the votes come in. And in that situation, the power is really transferred to the smaller parties who can give their support to one or the other and, and prop up a future government. But who are these smaller parties? Well, the big story of this election has been the SNP and their landslide victories, which were expected across Scotland, with um, a poll the other day suggesting they could win every single seat. This is going to give them a massive voice in Parliament. But they won't have the same power in coalition negotiations because they've already said they won't support the Tories. On the other hand, the party we should really be looking at is the Northern Irish Democratic Unionist Party. They're traditionally seen as, a co uh, as a, an ally of the Conservatives, but in fact they were very clear when they announced their manifesto last week that they would work with either party. As a result, they've got the power to be the kingmakers if it really comes down to the line. But the main thing we should be thinking is that after the election, no matter who is in power, there's going to be a lot of power transferred from the front benches and the government to the backbenchers and the minority parties. You can be guaranteed there will be lots of conversations going on, furtive phone calls, and not just between um, the Lib Dems and the other two, but with you know, a lot of others as well. So that is exactly what's happening at this moment. The other thing that's happening at this moment is Jeremy Hayward, who is the Cabinet Secretary. He will be in sort of more or less permanent session with uh, the heads of the, the uh, departments, civil service heads. And I suspect also in discussion with the Conservatives and Labour so that there will be a programme that they can uh, push through immediately. I mean, I've, I'm very, you know, my own experience with the civil service is it is a Rolls Royce machine. So as far as business is concerned, I think, you know, we've got the very, very best guys there that can, you know, that, that are going to be able to sort this out as uh, quickly as possible. <laughs>